chance. So I'm now preparing myself. I'm now preparing myself to attack him. The moment he moves inside my space, my safe zone, which is here, this is when I strike him. As we'll see, and he moves back, he moves inside my safe space, boom, and I'm going to hit him. I'd launch all of my body weight into this technique. The hand is in a relaxed manner. It has to come from where it starts. If your hand is here, like so, it's going to move from there and strike the jaw. And you'll notice that I'm rotating the hip via the ball of the foot. This is important. If you want to generate enough power to really finish this guy off, you need to get that hip rotation. Some of you guys, if you play golf out there, it's that same swing. Some of you play tennis, it's that same swing. Some of you even do boxing, it's the same as a right cross or a right hook. It's that same movement. And you drill this movement. You drill it in practice on bags and pads, which I'll show you how to use. So here we go. We've got this position here, and he's at the range. He walks into range. I, tell him, I talk to him, he moves in, and I hit him hard. The moment I hit him, boom, he goes down to the ground. Okay? Once he's down, guess what you do? You run off. If he makes an attempt to get up, or you feel like he's being, he is more aggressive than you give credit to, i.e. he's carrying a knife, stamp on his ankle joints. Stamp on his ankle joints. And you stamp on them, bam, as hard as you can to keep him down whilst you make good your escape. Once you've escaped, you're fine. You're safe. You don't need to go back. Okay? Andy? So that's a basic, a basic line-up and a basic strike. Because none of this would work if you were switched off. So on this video series, this DVD series, there's no way I'm going to talk about what do you do if you get attacked from behind. You shouldn't be attacked from behind. It's as simple as that. It shouldn't happen. So when we're aware of what's going on, we can deal with threat. And he could have been at this angle here. Yeah, I've noticed him acting suspiciously, so I start to make good me escape. I am going to start to leave the pub, the venue, wherever I am. If he starts to say something to me at this point, or even moves towards me, I'll go, well, what's the problem, man? I'll see how I give myself space, I give myself time, I give myself space. And he'll voice off. What are you fucking looking at me? Yeah, what's your fucking problem? I've got a fucking problem. I have got a problem, mate. I'm just saying fucking calm down. Okay? The moment he makes his move again, boom, am I hit him this way this time? My preference, though, is this. Every single time. It's something I've drilled that becomes an SOP, a standard operational procedure. <laughs> or even a simple operational procedure. Because it is. Anyone can learn to slap. My girlfriend does it. Okay? So anyone can learn to slap. Practice this on pads and equipment. You'll develop a tremendous amount of power. But the important thing is to hit here, the jaw. Because this creates movement that way, which creates a brain stem knockout. Once you've got a brain stem knockout, it's very, very powerful. Trust me, I've used it a lot. It's got me out of a lot of scrapes. As I say, other techniques, you can use this. You can use this. But essentially, you find what works for you and practice just that particular skill. Just that one strike. Because that's all you need. The best boxers, the best martial artists in the world tell you, well, I only ever win my fights with one technique. It's either the Akazuki, yes, I've done karate. Yeah? It's either a right cross or a right rounders kick, but I always win my fights with that. That's what they depend on. And you, as a street fighter, should do the same thing. You don't need to learn a plethora of techniques, fancy moves, blocks, encounters. Fix your mind on one thing. That's my hand technique. That's the one I'm going to use. That's the one I'm going to take the guy down. If it's forward, that's the one you practice. Whether it's the chain or the forehead, that's the one you practice over and over and over again. This is the secret of the SAS. There is no secret. You just practice those simple procedures over and over and over and over and over again. And when you think you've learned them, you keep on practicing it. That's the secret. You'll see that whenever I've been in a situation, when I've been switched on, I've been approached by an individual that looks less than desirable. Yeah? I take some sort of guard position. For me, it's this position here, and I always say the same thing. And that same thing is, look, man, I don't want any trouble. Just calm down. You can say anything you want. I've got a friend who says, is that a big giraffe or a small one? That used to get a response out of the, <laughs> the opponent, usually for amusement and curiosity. Okay? So you, you work out what you're going to say. But again, it's an SOP. Guess what you do? You practice it. You say it over and over and over again. Do it in the fucking mirror. Just stand in front of the mirror and go on. Hey, man, what's your fucking problem? I don't want any trouble. Hey, man, is that a big giraffe or a small giraffe? I like the size of your cock. It's tiny. You say whatever you want to say, but you say it over and over and over again. Obviously, be 
keep your voice down because the neighbours are going to think you're completely bizarre. I know mine do, but that's another tip. So, there's my lineup. That's my set. I'm controlling my situation. But hey, let's say what, what happens if you're in a position like so. You've been pretty switched on. You know this guy's a threat. You're starting to make your move to orientate yourself to move to control the space. And he reaches out to grab your push it. Yeah, like this. It's pretty straightforward. It's not a fancy block. I'm just going to push it down. And then I'm going to move in and attack him. If I feel he's sufficient of a threat. We're going to look in a short while at head controls. Okay? These are where we start to really control the opponent. At the moment, I'm teaching you striking techniques. And it doesn't matter if he grabs me with this hand. Now, boom, I'm going to hit him with this hand. Because guess what? I've practiced it. I've practiced it over and over again. If all you've practiced is this strike and he grabs you here, it's not a problem. Pull his hand down and strike him here. I'm keeping this as simple as possible. Okay? And even to the point where if you feel you're aggressive, an aggressive personality, and I know a lot of you aren't, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this DVD. Yeah, if somebody gets aggressive with me, I up the ante. So Andy starts getting aggressive with me. Fucking, yeah, I'm fucking looking at you. I'm fucking looking at you. Fucking yeah. Fucking yeah. Looking at you. yeah, that's what I do. I'll get aggressive. I'll up the ante. But make sure that if you're going to do this type of, yeah, this type of response, if you're going to have this type of response to what could be a potentially violent individual, yeah, make sure you can fight because he's going to kick off. But I tell you, more often than not, the times I've done that to people, they've backed out. Their arse has gone from the size of a 5p to a 50p. But what's 45p between friends? Okay? So there's a number of responses you can have. All I'm offering here is the, the, the choice, really. Yeah? What I'm giving you here is choices. You take and pick from this series of DVDs what you feel will work for your personality. And hey, if you've got no personality, we can start working on that. Okay. So, we've got this scenario here, we've got the line-up, we've got the strikes, all well and good. Okay, if someone grabs you, as we've just seen, pull my hand down, it's easy enough, and strike the head. You may have noticed that when Andy grabbed me from this side, I actually struck my left hand. It's not necessary. I can pull with the left hand and strike here to the throat. I use the technique, which is quite a disarming technique, but actually can be potentially lethal if you strike the guy on the track here, the front of the throat here, because what I'm doing is I'm using the web of the hand. Remember what I said at the beginning of the DVD? You've got one weapon here. Multifunctional tool. It's like, if you like, the Leatherman of unarmed combat. Lots of little different bits on it. The Swiss Army knife of hands, yeah? And here's one I prepared earlier. I can strike with this part of the hand, the web of the hand, exceptionally powerful, as well as this section here. And of course, not forgetting you old karate guys out there, shoot all of the edge of the hand against the karate. Again, we'll be looking at that later. My preference is always to hit with the heel of the palm. If you're going to go for eye gouges, i.e. you feel like the guy in front of you is actually potentially lethal, maybe he's carrying a blade, which a lot of young men do nowadays, yeah, the thumb stuck deeply into the eye here is perfect to do the job. It will dissuade any, any attacker. Okay? I've used this on more than one occasion. It worked. So, what have we got? With a hand, we've got the thumb, we've got the web of the hand, the heel of the palm, and the edge of the hand. Remember, guys, these are the weapons that you're going to use. We can then move up the arm somewhat, okay, because we've got one of the potentially most lethal weapons you've got in the human body. We can generate more power for square inch than anywhere else. Better than the knee, better than the kit. That's the elbow technique. Superb close range technique for doing tremendous amounts of damage to the opponent. Yeah? I mean, if Andy wants to move towards me aggressively, all I've got to do is lift my arm, and he walks onto this. And you know, we've got cameras everywhere nowadays. Yeah? And if you're seen smashing people with shit with elbow strikes, you're going to be in serious trouble. But this will look like I simply raise my hands to protect my head, which is what I want it to look like. I mean, why do I use that? Yes, it's safer for me, less safe for him. It's also safe for me if I end up in court, because essentially, what have I done? I've slapped the guy. I've slapped him in the head. That's all I've done. There probably won't be any cuts or any bruises even. Okay, he will be unconscious and it will do the job. The elbow on the other hand does leave cuts and marks. So we have to So you've got a guy who moves towards you. One way the elbow can be used effectively is like so, and he moves towards me, I'll raise the hand up like so. And he walks onto this elbow strike, basically. Okay? He literally walks onto it, he does most of the damage. And from there, of course, I can then return to the open hand slaps. Well, multiple slaps like this, which is a favourite of mine, mine, Kenny Taylor. 
He used to drive his hands in multiple strikes like this. So all he knew, but that got him out of more scripts you can imagine. He used to launch himself into the attack like so, and knock the guy literally off his feet, and then run away. That was the way he worked. And he used that a lot in Northern Ireland. I know I keep making reference to Northern Ireland, and if we've got any Northern Irish viewers out there, yeah? Uh, I'm not, it's not directed at Irish people, this is directed at members of terrorist organisations. So, we've got the racist thing out of the way. <laughs> so anyway, moving swiftly on. Using the elbow, okay? We can use the elbow for a lineup, particularly in a close environment such as a busy pub or a club where you've got lots of guys around you. Yeah, if I've got people around me drinking, talking and so forth, yeah? Yeah, I've got to use close range weapons. I can't use a palm oil strike. I don't have the time to do my lineup, my setup. Okay, so I'll take it from here. Andy starts on me. He's fucking yep. built for and, uh, He's on about spilling his pint. I'm going to do more than spill a pint. I'm going to hit him with a what we call a side elbow, strike him down on the head, the neck. And be honest, you hit anybody anywhere on the head, and it's going to take him out. You know what? I'm using my right hand because I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, you would you would use your left hand. You don't need to train the side of the body that doesn't work or function well. Work with what you know, your strength. So I tend to use my right. If I'd been left-handed in this particular instance, and Andy starts on me here, then I'm going to turn the body this way and strike him with the elbow like so. Okay? Hey, I can even just lift it straight up here and catch him under the chin here. Okay? The elbow is superb. If I do it at speed, you'll see why. It's like a short, sharp cutting weapon. It cuts down, cuts back, cuts up, cuts down. Yeah? Left or right, it doesn't matter. And to be perfectly honest, all of my students work with both left and right on elbows because it's like moving your head in, into a propeller blade. It just cuts away like so. You can even use it as a spinning and a turning weapon. I had one guy, a student of mine was attacking in a bar. This is a perfect example here. A bar's laid out here. This guy starts and gives him a dig in the ribs actually, <laughs> like this. <laughs> Paul wasn't happy about this, okay? We'd just been learning spinning elbows and he was a novice at this, remember? He said to the guy, look mate, I don't want any trouble, just calm down. Turned away and lifted the elbow up and smashed it down on his head. Okay? I don't need to tell you what happened to this guy. He crumbled to the ground. Paul made his get away. By the time the doorman had come, they'd already thrown out two other guys who they suspected of being violent. So the spinning elbow was superb. If you find this comfortable and easy to use, then use it. It's, as I say, it's got to be simple. And it's got to fit with what you know and can do and develop those skills. So if we look at the elbow from a standing position here, we can use it like this, like this, upper cut elbows, like so, overhand elbows like this, and even a spinning elbow like so. It may be, again, if this guy's particularly ruthless, a pretty nasty individual, you hit him and haven't quite struck him hard enough, move in and hit him again. And this is one of the principle that I want to make clear to you. I said the element of surprise is yours talked about aggression and speed. Aggression means move forward onto the attacker constantly and consistently, yeah, so that you scare the shit out of him. And if he's got any friends, they think you're crazy. So once I've moved in and hit Andy, whether he goes down or not, I'm going to keep going and keep the pressure on him until he's finished. This is a skill that all SAS troopers have. Even under ambush, our contact drills are the same. Lay down lots of fire and destroy the enemy. Attack the ambusher. That's what I'm teaching you here. Somebody moves in aggressively. I'll come to the first and go, what the fuck are you doing, pal? No, you're fucking dead. You made one move, pal, and you're fucking dead. I can leave that whole situation where I haven't struck him once. If I feel he's getting too aggressive, as you realise, I'm going to hit him hard and send him down to the ground. And then I'm going to make my way out. Something I wasn't really for me. I was more or less doing it for my father. 
um, I decided to join the army. Uh, they wanted to go in the infantry specifically. They tried to obviously narrow it down and put me in the engineers because of my training. I said, no, I want to be an infantry. I've been involved in martial arts when I was a kid. I was always interested in the warrior spirit and what it took to be a real fighter. I was aware that doing martial arts I was doing at the time, although I had started Thai boxing, just did not have that reality. It wasn't, there was no edge to it. It was a sport. I, I, I was never tested. And being an infantry man was a great way of being tested because you've got to realize at that time, in the 1970s, um, talking to the SAS, well, you would never hear of it. Nobody heard of the SAS. In fact, when I joined the army, I hadn't heard of the SAS. Mm. Uh, you know, this was 1977. Um, the SAS, never heard of it. It wasn't until I was in the army, and, and almost in for three years, when uh, I'd heard about the SAS. And it was at the time when I was thinking about actually leaving the, the forces. And my blessed sergeant major said, uh, look, you should, you should actually go for selection. You, you've been wasted here as an infantry. I was a corporal at the time, a section commander. Uh, so I, I went for, he put me forward for selection. He put me SF3C, special forces, British Bush and Carter, four days in Hereford see whether I liked what they did. Of course, that was no guarantee they were going to be asked to go for a selection. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the four days, I had my interview and they said, we'd like to put me on next, the next course, which was the winter course. Uh, and then I embarked on selection, which was a grueling sort of seven to eight month period of endurance in the mountains around the Brecht regions, obviously. I think everybody knows this stuff now. Uh, then it was six weeks in the jungle. Then it was three months of continuation training, learning new different weapon systems different tactics and techniques that the SAS used partic uh, particularly uh, for the different roles they have. And then finally it culminates in uh, the seven day escape invasion exercise where I was uh, caught bloody battered for three days by members of the parachute regiment, bless them. Um, and at the end of that ordeal, 242 was applied and 14 of us got through. And I was one of the 14, it was quite difficult. And once I passed selection, I then went with my home sailor squadron assigned to G Squadron, which was Mountain Troop, uh, and I was assigned 16 Troop, which was my particular troop guy, there were 16 of us in that particular troop, uh, and then got involved in lots of little frolics around um, around the world, uh, so I can talk about some of the Trans, Falklands was a big one, um, and of course Northern Ireland played a major part in my development, certainly, um, and it was the work I was doing in Northern Ireland that fitted in beautifully with the way I was teaching martial arts at the time. Involved in martial arts since the age of 10, uh, and then nearly 50. So it's, it's been a long, a long road to learning you know, about fighting. Um, and whilst I was serving uh, in the SAS uh, and in the army, I still continued my martial arts, uh, but actually was able to use it much the same way as a good yeoman learns a technique and he goes and practices it on unsavory characters. We would do the same thing. You find out one way or another whether these techniques work. Then I came into Civic Street. Came to Birmingham to do a drama degree of all things, um, which was awesome. I enjoyed that a lot. And I found that actually, um, no matter what I did, I didn't seem to have any fear of it. I think that came from being in the SAS. Um, people used to be scared to go on stage, and I thought this is nothing. You know, it never bothered me. People said to me, "How do you, how do you do this? How can you cope with fear uh, and just deal with the situation?" I said, "Well, I don't have any doubts about my ability, so I have no fear." to tie one of my books, No Doubt, No Fear. Because um, I firmly believe that if you have no doubts about your abilities, you're prepared to do anything, anything you want. And it's about that self-belief and, and totally immerse, immersing yourself in your identity. Um, and then much later, people kept asking me the question, well, how do you build this confidence? How do you do this thing? And that's when I sort of discovered NLP and uh, trained with Richard Bandler and Richard Graham and uh, went on a course down in London and, and learned a hell of a lot about NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming understanding how people can change their perceptions of the world yeah, to give them the best they can out of life. And I realized that I did this in a lot of cases and started teaching these strategies for becoming fearless, building confidence, building motivation. But I mean, I use it in other contexts as well, not pertinent to this particular series of DVDs, but it was a very powerful tool. Um, and that was really, that's where I am today and why I'm making good DVDs and writing books the way I am and writing for you know, magazines on martial arts about having this ability to change your perception of a situation and to deal with it effectively. You'll notice on these DVDs, there's not a 
great deal of physical technique. It's about aggression uh, and about building that confidence and your ability to deal with a, what is essentially a life threatening situation. Look, if you can do it, is it average guys? The SAS are filled. You know, the ranks of the SAS are filled with average guys who are just prepared to push themselves out a little bit further. And when they do, they find out amazing things about themselves. Some of the most innocuous pit fighters you've ever met have served in the SAS. And they're, they're genuine warriors. And I am heartily sick of reading about warriors in martial arts magazines. And I think it's time to really get some eyes. There's so many people claiming this and claiming that. I think what you've got to do is you've got to ask, ask them, have they used it? Have they actually done it? And if you meet someone like a member of the parachute regiment or a member of the SAS or a member of the armed forces who fought in conflicts, they're the real warriors. They're the guys who actually have actually faced death. Yeah? 